I guess you have to sort of start right at the beginning. I mean, it's not, it's, it, it's not always a, um, a lineal sort of process, um, understanding your journey, but I guess for me, acknowledging some of the coping strategies yeah. as a boy um, are, very, are very relevant to my relationship with alcohol and drugs. Well, I was born in New Zealand, um, but I was born up um, in, in South Auckland with, with family members. So myself and my parents, they were saving for our first home and so we stayed with my mother's side of the family. So I was brought up in a Catholic Samoan environment um, amongst all my, my cousins. I remember being incredibly shy and, and um, self-conscious around how I, how I looked even at a young young age I had I thought I just had a strange walk and a strange shaped head and, and yeah I just didn't have any any confidence um, I did okay at school I really felt that I was different from other children from an earlier earlier age just because I found it difficult to relate to a lot of other children and I was brought up you know primarily you know in a sporting sort of environment so my father from a very early age, made sure that I was involved in in, uh, in sport um, and that I was engaged at school. He was very strict around those sort of things. Uh, and I guess I grew up with the the belief that if that I if, if I achieved in those areas, um, that I would feel somewhat included. From a very very young age, I placed a lot of importance on achieving things in a sporting environment. Um, I wasn't particularly a gifted athlete as such, so I had to work really hard at the physical um, athletic side of sport. I did have some uh, natural ability in regards to hand-eye coordination and drive, um, mainly because of my you know, underlying feelings around I had to be good at something um, in order to feel wanted. It was unusual for a child to carry so much weight in that space. I remember probably at the age of nine or ten not making a, 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 a representative team in football and just being literally beside myself crying. I remember at sort of 12 years old having shingles which was basically a, a, a byproduct of stress. I was supposed to go to a, you know, to, to, a, to a, um, a psych at that age, but because of the stigma attached to that, my family decided that that wasn't going to happen. After that first failure, I, you know, pretty much from the age of 10 years old, was training before school, lunchtime, after school, um, and managed to get myself improve enough to get into a, um, a um, performance academy for football. School I managed to scrape by. Um, both, my, both my parents worked huge hours to make ends meet. We had our own home by this point. So we were left around our own devices for big parts of the day. So I was sort of responsible for my brother um, while waiting for my parents to get home from work. It was sort of at this point where I kind of felt a sense of disconnection, I guess, from the general world. I'd found it really difficult to, I was very quiet, um, which you know a lot of people perceived as being well behaved. Bear in mind that as a child you think whatever your experience is, is normal, um, but I had you know, maybe one friend who I used to go fishing with, um, but because he wasn't involved in the sports I was involved in, we sort of grew apart. So I was quite a lonely, lonely child, even though I was playing team sports and quite unnaturally focused on wanting to achieve this and, you know, not really for myself, but for other people. My father had sent, applied for me to, to go to his hometown in Leicester City and they sent scouts to watch me play. When I turned sort of 15, I was um, able to go and take up this apprenticeship in Leicester and so I left home on my own to go to UK and had to stay with um, friends of my father that I didn't really know uh, so I had to grow up pretty fast. Um, I went there and spent a season there 
and then came back home after that season and there was quite a bit of publicity around me taking up schoolboy forms there. Unfortunately, while I was in New Zealand, the uh, manager there got fired and so they null and voided my contract, which was a huge disappointment, especially after spending time in the media around you know, around that, I remember when um, England came to play, I think it was New Zealand in the centennial um, celebration game, and I had to go out on the, in the middle of this football pitch and juggle the ball in front of thousands of people, which was I literally threw up before I went out <laughs> went out there. So to then, you know, have have something out of my control um, take place, uh, yeah, it was it was hugely disappointing, and I felt probably more alone than I've ever felt in that period of time. Everything around um, that sport was supported how I viewed myself. So yeah, any any rejection or failure in that really carried, with, I carried a lot of that with me. I then got included in our, um, I think it was, it, was, it was our schools of excellence back then, so it was about a build up for our under 17 World Cup for New Zealand. I remember traveling around the country um, for various um, ver various games, I kept in that side, and so that was my first introduction to sort of leadership and having to speak in front of people. Um, again, the amount of anxiety that I carried back then around that was, I know now, not not really manageable. It was, you know, I would literally have to go and throw up in the toilets before any of this happened, but I managed to sort of put a mask on and pe people just assumed that that was, that I was coping. But the whole time I found I was drowning. Yeah, it affected my sleep, it affected everything. Um, it affected how I made friends. Uh, it, it affected how I viewed relationships. So I was constantly searching for validation in any relationship I had, if it was with football coaches, or for, you know, Kevin Fallon was in my, my, my life at this point, and it just, I became obsessed with pleasing, making that him feel accepted, and his, his personality was very old school Irish Yorkshireman. Um, he, was, he, was, he was hard, to say the, to say the least. Um, so it was a fear-based fear relationship a, a lot of the time, so. It put stress on my own relationship with my father because the responsibility of who I, who I thought I needed to please shifted to him and I, and I felt like I lost that father relationship early. So after I finished um, my schooling, I went down to um, Mount Monganui who were in the National League back then who Kevin Fallon was coaching and, um, and started training full time down there with him and playing in our National Men's League at 16 year old. So, I was, you know, in an adult world as a as a child, really. But I was pretty much up to my own devices. That was my the first time I started using, I guess, um, substances and alcohol, to kind of pass the time or deal with the level the way I was feeling. I spent a lot of time um, with a girlfriend at that time. It was my first sort of real girlfriend. So, so there was some sort of risky behaviour in that space. The sport was going okay. I was playing senior, you know, senior national league as a kid. It got a lot of attention from overseas. And so myself and Kevin Valenson, we, we left and went to trial at various clubs. When we got to sort of Liverpool, it was, I, you know, I was, I was achieving physical goals which I'd never done in my life. My, my, I felt like I could do anything. It was, I felt like I could take on the world. And I was training with people who were gods in my world, you know, I just grew up watching them on, on television on Match of the Day. And yeah, things, things and they, obviously they, they liked what they saw and I, I, sign, I signed for them. You know, being with adults, I was experimenting with drugs on the side and alcohol was something of a regular. Um, and about a year into that contract, those feelings of I can do anything just overnight changed to I could barely get out of bed. You know, I, could, I, I was incredibly low, I was homesick, I was playing terrible, and because the drop-off was so, so sudden, I was getting constantly hammered and, from the coaches and, at, at, the, at the club. And, and um, I think my lasting memory, I remember when I, I'd had enough and my father came over with my um, family 
and they generally as a policy don't ever let uh, media or families into the inner sanctum of the club but I just remember they made an exception because of how far they were coming and how much they saw that I really needed some kind of support and um, I remember telling my father that yeah that I, I trying to tell him what was going on for me and he was just so caught up in the in the fanfare of being able to be in this you know worshipped place I guess that he, he kind of just ignored that yeah and I was doing a um, at the same time doing a, doc, a small documentary with um, Dylan Tate and he was working for Paul Holmes at the time and so it, it just got all slid under the under the rug after that I came back to New Zealand, played in our Olympic side, didn't go well. Um, and while I was away, they signed other players in my position, which went from, you know, playing in sort of reserves and 18 football, which was sort of youth team football, to their first team within a few weeks. And so it was decided that, um, you know, that I would, would, either, would either have to start looking at other clubs or you know, really up my game. Now, unfortunately, at that point, I got a quite serious injury where I tore a three-inch gap in my hamstring, um, which kind of put an end to that. So they tell you that your contract's not going to be renewed, and then that's it, pretty much, and you're sort of on your own. So I didn't want to come home to New Zealand as a failure. I went and tried, I went and um, played in various clubs through Belgium and Finland uh, for short stints. I started using harder drugs until, yeah, until it just got really unmanageable. And I had to come home. And I remember coming home and uh, walking in the car in the uh, airport and my mother's taking one look at me and bursting into tears. I kind of played around in my head around what it might look like to get help at this point. But a long time ago, I sort of committed to my family that I would you know, when I thought things were going, when things were going well, that I was going to pay their mortgage off. And that was something which really stuck with me and I felt like a failure if I went back on that. So I, as soon as I got back, I sort of started looking at jobs or ways I could, I could, I could still keep that commitment. So I went into sort of corporate sales with selling photocopiers, fax machines and kind of found that I had an ability to sort of connect with people. There was no depth to these relationships, but I could, you know, I was a good listener and I, and, 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 and I, I didn't make promises I couldn't keep, which sort of served me well. I decided I'd try something different and, and thought that I would um, go into the hospitality and, and, and build a bar. I had enough money to kind of get a start on that, but I needed my um, family support to, to make that happen. I went in partnership with two other people and we, we built a bar and, and uh, from resource consent up, which was quite an achievement back then, considering I had no knowledge in that field whatsoever. Didn't really realise it, I thought I was just using drugs to sort of recreationally, but looking back on it, it was just a way for me to be able to function and, and feel for like a fit in. Um, it was a freeing feeling. I could be anyone I really thought I wanted to be, that people wanted me to be, I should say. I was kind of only one bad decision away from, from a real problem and some real consequences around what that meant. And I managed to hold that together to around 2000, I think, um, around time of America's Cup. Unfortunately, as soon as America's Cup went down to the viaduct, because we were in Parnell at the time, um, it drew pretty much 60% of the business down there. So we tried to get creative around keeping people in, you know, as long as we could up in that space, made more financial commitments to, you know, to having limos and things like that. So pe pe keep people in the bar and then we would shuttle people down to another friend of mine's bar down there. In the meantime, in the background, one of my partners who I didn't do any due diligence with um, came unstuck with the inland revenue. Apparently he'd caused that he'd, he'd come he'd come into a lot of fraud in other countries, um, and his life unravelled, and he was staring down the barrel, barrel of a um, of fraudulent case and thirty million dollars worth of debt. Um, he 
took his own life down in the bottom of Parnell Rise and then the Inland Revenue stepped in um, and closed me down purely because they thought that a lot of this money was getting washed through, through this business, which wasn't the case. Through that process, I had no income. I had a sizable drug habit by this stage. Um, and I had a debt to, to, to uh, sustain. Otherwise, I was looking at losing my family's home. As you can imagine, that put a lot of stress on, my f on, on, on that relationship. And so I sort of, um, I guess, hustled around what, what, what can I do? And one thing I, I could do was sell. And another thing I could do is I had a con met lots of contacts through the hospitality world and many different, different levels and um, had access to drugs and volume and had access to people with money. That's when things started to get serious and I was um, selling a lot of drugs um, to sustain an income. Um, and I was basically just ignoring debtors um, and just shoveling unclean money straight into an account to try and sustain this effectively a, a, a debt. My habit was getting to the point where I was using every day I was using meth primarily, which sort of uh, transitioned into every drug you can think of to manage every mood and to, and to um, I guess, numb these feelings of failure and, things were, and, and, and not to think too much around how things were spiraling out of control. And so I went down to Awakuni with my partner at the time and um, got a job running the Turo Ski Lodge down there. And, you know, and, and I managed to make ends meet with some dealings with the bank around a manageable repayment. I still wasn't dealing with the inland revenue at this point. I was hiding from them or just not returning their calls. So I knew that was something else which was going to have to be addressed. I spent a season down there. Then by this time, the inland revenue caught up with me and um, I had to pay a bit, obviously a lot more. So again, I sort of, by through, through the industry down there, met a lot of people that wanted access to volumes of drugs. I had people up in Auckland that were willing to bring the drugs down. And I started using again. In the midst of that, I was in quite an unhealthy relationship with a local, uh, local woman. When you're in this sort of state, you don't, you're not making the best of decisions. And we ended up, um, having my first child. At the time, I knew nothing about mental health. Um, my partner suffered postnatal post, post depression and then fell pregnant again. Um, it, was, it was a probably one of the hardest periods of my life. I was dealing with a very unstable lady um, two children, a huge debt, a, a pretty sizable habit by this stage. My mental health deteriorated quite quickly. It got to the point where I was questioning whether I even wanted to be on this planet anymore and made a reasonably serious effort, putting me, landing me in a hospital. And the shame that went with that, with two children, was something where, which forced me to make a decision that either I you know, either I stay in this relationship and it turn into something which is not me or try and start again. That process was difficult. Walking away from my children, yeah, it just sent me further down that, down that hole. I was sort of um, helped building a, a quite a big hospitality hub up in um, the Biaduck. I was traveling down on the weekends to, um, to see my children you know, the drive down to, to Awakuni was becoming dangerous. I, mean, I was doing double shifts and, and, and almost falling asleep at the wheel a couple of times. So I was using more and more meth through the industry, met you know, a, a lot of people through the Asian community and was, had access to cheaper and cheaper drugs to the point where I was, I, you know, I could just basically do a, do a milk run around the country, um, dropping, dropping drugs off, picking up money, making a, a really good living out of that but 
you know, I wasn't sleeping very often. This went on for kind of five, six years. The ante was going up. I was, you know, I was meeting more people. I was learning how to make meth. I was looking at huge deals, uh, more gang involvement at that level. Um, and I was a naive to everything. Uh, it wasn't until through sheer chance I had my first brush with the law um, through meeting with one particular guy who was under surveillance. He was in the um, casino and brought some of the covers down. Um, and so that was the first touch with the law. I ended up in, um, in the cells for over the weekend while I, while I processed my bail application. I was unlucky and lucky. Um, the drugs I had on me were in a bag which wasn't on me when the police pulled up. Um, obviously they searched the car and found them, but there was nothing to link me to that car or those drugs. And so I did have a very long shot legal case to be able to avoid a consequence around that. While I was on bail for that, it, it took a long time for the police to build this case. They were building it more on the person that came down to me. He was more high profile. Um, but in my mind, I needed a, a good lawyer. I needed it fast and I needed the money to be able to pay for him. Um, so that was my logic at the time. And so I upped the game again and started um, spending every living moment of my life in a, in a, in a, in a meth lab, working for someone else, um, and taking my cat off the top, under the, telling myself that I was doing this from everything, from doing this for my children, I'm doing this for, for legal, and once I, did, once I finish this I'll, I'll get out. And through that process I um, had a, a fairly good habit with downtown, um, and meth. Um, I was also using GBL to to sort of um, as kind of a as kind of a relaxing agent. Um, and if you know anything about that, it can be quite messy. And I promptly fell asleep at the traffic lights with a full meth lab on my boot. With the at the time assistant chief Com police commissioner Mike Bush in his motorcade about four cars behind me and I remember um, yeah waking up to his um, right hand man pulling the keys out of my car and I thought the game was up at that point. Um, I'd been introduced to Ron Mansfield through some Asian friends of mine um, you know I had enough money to for him to get started, but no money after that. Um, and it was at that point I kind of really I decided, oh, things were unraveling for me and I remember opening up to, to him, to my lawyer. And um, it was the first time I'd legitimately kind of reached out to anyone. And I remember him treating me, treating me with you know, with a general sense of, of empathy and compassion, which I hadn't felt anywhere in my life before. Primarily, but probably because I didn't let anyone in. But yeah, people talk about rock bottom. I'm not a big believer in rock bottom. I feel like I just keep digging. But if there was a, a, a point in my life where I felt really vulnerable, that would be the point. And, um, on top of that, he he knew my situation, and rather than pile on top, he said he would do the rest of my case pro bono. At the time, I didn't realise how big that was for someone, a lawyer of his stature, but it's not lost on me now, and I've reached out to him since then to sort of make sure that he knows that um, that was much appreciated. I saw my lawyer speaking to my bush, and he. He came over and, and said, you need to go over and, and thank him because he's just done you a major solid. So he had withdrawn any extra charges on top of those. And um, I went and said, to, I didn't, to be honest, I, I was really high. 
and I, I went and apologised, but I didn't really know what was happening. And I just remember him saying to me, stopping me and saying, listen, you don't need to talk to thank me, you just need to, I just want to see you turn your life around. And that kind of really hit home that I was finally starting to realise at this point that things were bad, like worse than ever. My lawyer said to me that you've got to go out and um, get into a rehab. I didn't know what, even what that, what, what, even what that looked like in this country. Um, so I went to, I'll never forget going to CADS, um, to a one day course, and then going to see my lawyer with a certificate for this one day course, and he literally laughed me out of his, out of his office. Told, gave me the number of a couple of other places. That was when I should have engaged. You know, looking back, there was there was many windows of opportunities for intervention, but I just didn't. There was just no one, no one there. Um, I was really wandering through the legal system and and addiction, just naive to everything. Progressively getting worse. Progressively getting more unwell. Progressively getting more delusional progressively getting more isolated. I, I hadn't spoken to my family in so long. My father was just beside himself under pressure with, um, with the banks, which was just, you know, I, I wasn't seeing my children. It was just really piling up. On top of that, in amongst the equipment of my, of, that I had in my boot was a lot of a product which the police at the time weren't aware of, which contained Ephedrine, which I had been given by some Asian contacts of mine who had a lot to do with a particular gang. And they came looking for their, for their money and um, I didn't have it. And so I was back in the lab again, thinking I'll just get this sorted and then I'll be you know, through the court system. Something will happen. And um, of course, as it would happen, I was raided in the middle of one of these, um, in the situation, and I was back into into custody. I was uh, that arrest was rather traumatic. It was armed defenders and dogs and over twenty police and uh, decontamination in front of the public in broad daylight in my underwear. And then I was um, taken to ACRP, the correctional prison. It's remand. So I went, obviously I was, I was in the holding cells. At district court while I waited um, and that's when I had my first complete breakdown I was you know I knew that was it and it was done and um, I was fucking angry and upset all in the same you know was too angry angry to cry too upset to be angry, it was a really weird feeling, but I could tell that everyone around me was feeling uncomfortable. And it's the first time that I'd ever heard of Odyssey. And this guy told me, well, you know, everyone was basically knew I was screwed. And he says, you know, there's always Odyssey, you could go there, you could go there. You just gotta, and he was trying to talk me through the process of being there. And even if you don't want to stay there, you could just do a safe exit and, and just and just run and go on the run. Although it was well intended, it wasn't the best advice, but it was it was the first little glimmer of hope that I had in that space. I thought there was actually some place that I can call that might help me. And so that's what I focused on, you know, even though going through the court process and I remember going through sentencing, I remember them starting at 16 years, I remember that feeling like it was yesterday and hearing my, my whole family just burst into tears. Ron Mansfield, my lawyer, I remember him early on in the process saying to me, I know this is going to be hard for you, but you've just got to trust me. You've got to trust me. I'll make my, I'll make, I'll make, I'll earn, I earn my money in the sentencing. And um, I remember hearing him vaguely talking around. Obviously, he'd done a lot of homework with my family and and me, and he explained my fall from grace, if you like, in a way which which I really related to. It was actually he was pretty much on spot on, and. Um, he connected with the, the judge at that time and he, he gave me discounts on areas where I wasn't entitled to them. 
got it down to just under eight years. Um, and as I was being let off from the stand, from sentencing, um, again, my lawyer pulled me aside and just said, Get, can, can I have 10 minutes with him? And he just said to me, while you're in prison, this is what you need to do. You need to keep your head down. You need to get a job. You need to get involved in the in the wing. Get jobs. Get everything you do. You do everything that you're told. Get you know. Don't get don't get him pulled into anything you don't need to. And we'll get a shot at the first parole. With your history, we we we've had it. We do have a shot at it. And so I just followed his his lead. I just keep my head down. I got the wing job. Um, and um, yeah, I just got clean. I was coming off every drug you can think of. The first six months I was incredibly ill. I thought I was dying. I was in, I was in a special needs unit. Um, I was hallucinating. I had a relationship with one sock. I, mean, I, can't, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I, couldn't let, I thought if I lost the sock that was going to be the end of my life. I was, it was horrific. I was, um, because at the time I, was, I had access to methadone and, and heroin and I was, um, you know, I was, I was um, using the IV use, but I wasn't on, in the system, so I couldn't get, on, get on any reduction plan in there. So I was basically cold turkey in that, cold turkey in males, cold turkey in everything. And the first six months went, I don't even remember really how, it just went like a blink. I remember just being in a pool of sweat, throwing up, um, can't even remember conversations I had. It wasn't until I got sort of through um, into and sentenced um, into the mainstream population where I'd been classified, that I started, I, can, I felt coherent. And I just remember Odyssey House. I didn't want to speak to anyone else, and basically no one else really wanted to speak to me. I did have my family come in to see me every now and then, but that was difficult. Um, so I remember ringing, uh, speaking to the guards and, and um, asking them if I could ring a rehab, which they thought was hilarious. But um, I could get, fine, this particular um, screw, I could get phone calls through their office um, for that. And I would ring every week. It was just like my, my whole week revolved around those phone calls. I remember talking to Adria on the phone and it was sort of like my support person in there and my hope. And although you know, I did trust my lawyer that once you've been in there long enough, you kind of start realising how um, how difficult it would be to even get through to your first parole. No one gets first parole, especially if you hadn't done any um, any treatment and in, in, in any any courses in there, which I was finding really difficult to even get access to. So yeah, I just every week I'd speak to her, and um, and she says, yes, we've got a bed available around the time of your, your first parole. You know, by this stage, I think it was just under four years had gone by. I can't even remember really the conversations we had, but that's week by week. It was just this organisation, that per, that voice on the phone just kept me going. And um, came to the to the parole board and it just was, 99% of it was, you know, was very negative. <laughs> and it wasn't until sort of the last the last sort of two minutes when one of the board members um, said, but we're going to give you a chance. We're going to, we're going to, we don't feel that you, you'll probably be back. It's a very difficult pr program, but we're going to give you a chance. And they gave me the opportunity to come to Odyssey. And that was where my journey started. Um, and my relationship with this organisation started. And it was... It was um, life-changing for me. Um, I had no clothes. I had no bank account. I had no ID. I just, um, an ex-partner of mine, she was angry at me. Um, so she, the only clothes she left in the RO for me was a pair of jeans, women's jeans, which didn't fit me, and a, a little T-shirt which came up to here. Uh, um, which, I mean, I've got a sense of humour. In hindsight, I thought, you know, it would be quite funny. Um, at the time, I was so... I think it was a good reflection of my self-worth around then, how it just didn't even matter to me. I could have walked out in my underwear, and it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, I remember coming to 
driving down this long drive, long driveway and seeing all the other people and uh, looking out the window. And um, yeah, it was like Christmas. I thought it was like Christmas. It was literally, I just thought at this, at this point, I'm just going to do what I need to do, be where I need to be, do what I'm need to told, engage where I need to engage. I'm going to really grab this opportunity because another four years in prison didn't really appeal to me. And I just had enough. I just had enough. So yeah, came into the program, it took me 14 months. I had some unbelievable people connect with me in that space. It was never just one person, it was, it was a perfect combination of a few people and a perfect combination of people I did treatment with. Um, and it was a real gradual, layered building, rebuild of me as a person. It was, uh, some people you'll hear say, oh, it's like you've been stripped down to a baby and then built back up again. I was already a baby when I turned up here. I literally had no real life skills. I've been so off the, off the grid for like years, well, a couple of decades, it seemed like, you know, close to that. And so it felt like I, you know, I, I time traveled. I think when I went to prison, the first iPhone was sort of people using. And so I came out to a sort of completely different world well, that was a, it wasn't a, that long, really, but it was, there was a lot of things happening in that space. So it was, it, was a, it was a safe bubble for me. I don't think if I'd gone straight back out into the community, it would, it, would have been, it would have been unmanageable, but this was a really safe place. And it had you know, a lot of and structure I needed to be able to sort of rebuild and get to know you know, myself better. Within the program, you get, you build responsibilities, you become more responsible for other people. And I enjoyed that aspect of it. I enjoyed um, supporting other people. I gained more confidence in, in things I thought. I was always quiet and a good listener and from a young age, learnt to read people's body language and learnt to try and understand what they're feeling because I just didn't want to have to communicate. It was just too, it was just too much anxiety around that. And so all these things which I developed through my, through my life became quite useful, uh, you know, in, 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 this, in this setting. And I found that I had this ability to be able to reach people where they sit without judgment and I also learned that I got as much out of that as they did. And so I really engaged in that whole, well, as, I, as it would seem, peer movement, I guess. I didn't know what it was called, but I was just like, I learned within that small community that, I, that, 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 that there's a place for me where I felt useful. And not only that, I liked me doing that. And it helped me heal. It helped me heal and it helped me discover a version of myself I never knew even existed. I didn't think that, that I was going to take that as a career path. I felt a sense of connection to the space and to the people in it and a sense of purpose that of giving back. Um, when I graduated and left, I was working with my brother in the... Um, in the marine trade, so I was doing a lot of work on super yachts, mainly um, painting and repair jobs and things like that. And um, within that setting, I found that a lot of these skills were transferable working in big teams, and um, and yeah, quite quite quickly with the tools which I realised I had and developed in that space, found that I was always quite quickly um, put into sort of into, in, into um, roles of responsibility and managing other people, supporting other people. I've always had the ability to sort of be a leader, I guess, um, in my actions, mainly. I've never sort of asked people to do things which I'm not prepared to do myself, which kind of has always, you know, served me well. I was still staying in contact with, obviously I was coming to grad groups, I wanted, I, I, it was the only sort of social interaction I ever had was like every couple of weeks I'd come back to the house and we'd have a grads group and I'd connect with the people that were there at the time. Um, 
It was the only thing I did socially. Um, about three years of working in that trade, I'd been made redundant a couple of times. Uh, it was the, the, um, the industry was really, really bombing. And um, I just got to the point where I started thinking whether physically I could see myself doing this forever or you know, I needed to start thinking of a career which had some kind of future in it. And while I was sharing this in the group, um, the group facilitator afterwards came and see me and planted the seed of, uh, do you think you'd, you'd think about working in this field? And that was something which was completely left field for me. I hadn't even thought about, but it kind of it ruminated with me. And then I got made redundant again. And I thought, well, why not? So I started at Te Wairau Counties. It was just amazing. I, I re it was kind of like the cherry on top for my own personal journey because I was learning about things which really opened my eyes to what the real issues were around what made me vulnerable to addiction. I became absolutely more aware of the things which um, influenced my, my you know, where I ended up. Um, so I was learning and uh, about the work and how, how to be safe in that space and how, how to support more, you know, more, uh, you know, more people um, in a safe way but also learning about myself all in the same, the same period of time. Four years in that space flew by. The gratitude to the organisation grew like exponentially. So, now, so not only did I have um, an organisation which gave me another chance at life, they were also helping me build a better version of myself and they also provided me with a sense of purpose and a reason to get out of bed in the morning and feel good about it. Um, any money that I earned from it was by the by. I was just, I was just sold, and um, and it's just continued to grow. Ever since I've been with this organisation, I'm continuously learning. I'm continuously finding different ways to support people in many various different roles. It's not been something which is, I will say, that I've planned. It's just wherever I've felt the most useful. I guess is the right word. Wherever I feel I could add value, I've gone. I've been almost 10 years here now. I've had about five roles. I've rebuilt a life in my own personal life, which if someone had said to me that I would, I would have when I, when I even left here, I would have laughed. I've completely overachieved in every aspect of where I thought I would be. My relationship with my father, I remember rebuilding that, and I was with him for the last sort of six months of his life supporting him through the end, his end of life through, through hospitals. And I remember thinking, the last conversation I had with him before he lost his mind, and I remember him saying to, saying to me that he forgave me and was proud of what I'd done with my life. And the first thing I thought of was, if it hadn't have been for this organisation and what they've given to me, I wouldn't have had that moment with my father. And so I made sure that I, um, that I shared that with Fiona at the time, I think it was. So, what well, I guess, and what I'm saying is, this work, this organisation, what we stand for, what we try and do, it's never lost on me. And every any role I've had, every achievement that I've had since I've left here, or anything, anything, it's good as good as happened in my life. I, I, you know, I, I am, um, am incredibly grateful to this organisation and what they've provided for me, not only my own journey, but and thousands of other people's journey and providing me with a, I feel, I feel ashamed to call it a job, it's not you know, a, a way of supporting my life, but you know, I get as much as I, as much as I give, I get, and it's just a, a great place to work and with amazing people to work with. You need to find a sense of where you feel the most purpose and find a way to sustain that. You know, there needs to be a, a sense of service, a sense, a higher power, if you like, higher purpose, I think it's a better explanation of it, in order to, to be grounded enough to be able to survive in, in this field for yourself and for, and, and for other people. What keeps me grounded is that in order for me to, to be the best version of myself, I've got to be healthy. And through, my, through the last 10 years, I've had many, many challenges in my own personal space. It's a question of me and the people I've supported before, that keeps me grounded and 
keeps that humility around being okay to, 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 to then reach out again or to, which is, to say that I need a break. Or So when I see people that are looking at going into the, in, into the industry, for it to be long term, yeah, you need to be really, really sure that this is a space that you want to be and you can stay healthy and it can't just be, well, I'll go into that just to keep myself well. That's not enough on its own. If the people that I've seen do well in this industry have a real sense of grounded and purpose and um, alongside those things, it's not, a, it's not really a job to them, if that makes sense. Those things just come along with it. Yeah, the success that you might have within the sector just come a byproduct of that. So yeah, it's around where can you be the best version of yourself and sustain that. Try a few places, you know, try try a few different areas. Be sure this is what you want to do. I'd encourage people to be to ask a lot of questions. I'd encourage people to um, talk to a lot of people in, in the industry. Um, I'm not, it's not lost on me that there's a sense of like fate around my own pathway. You know, it's just, I, I can't really speak to that because I know that it's not the, the usual. One thing I can say that's what's helped is that every time I come here, it's not a day, it's not a job, it's not, it's not a drag, it's, it's just, yeah, this is, this is my place and this is, you know, what I, what I do and on, the, on a good day, it's just the most amazing job in the world. On a bad day, it, it can be the heaviest burden. So you, you have to have tools to deal with both. You know, to, to, be, to stay in the middle there and to reach consistently as many people as possible, you need to be the best, best version of yourself. And to, and to sustain that, you need to know, you know what drives you and what's gonna keep you well. Mm.